Okay, welcome to another edition of our Rock Identification with Will C Rock Series, a way for you to identify rocks that you find when you're out on adventures, hiking, looking at the natural world around you, or perhaps you're a student and you're just learning to brush up on your rock identification skills, then this is a series for you. Today we're going to look at the a couple of the metamorphic rocks, specifically some of the non-foliated metamorphic rocks. I think this will be the last in, in this series, at least for now. Uh, if I decide to do some other rock types later, I may add them. But at this point, we've covered uh, minerals with another series. We've covered an introduction to rocks, igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, metamorphic rocks. So I think this will conclude at least the more common types of rocks that you're likely to encounter out there. So we're going to go ahead and get started here with our, um, our notes, as we often do. Let's turn the camera around um, and get started with some information. And then we'll look at some rock samples, hopefully help you uh, identify your rock types a little bit better as well. Um, and so let's start with, work on the camera here. Um, we're going to be specifically looking at quartzite and marble, two um, somewhat similar looking metamorphic rocks. They're, they can be easily confused, but I'll show you a couple tips and tricks that will hopefully help you identify these a little more definitively. So these are non-foliated rocks, meaning that the rocks themselves have been compressed and heated up by t higher temperatures but they do not have the layering for the most part that we see in the foliated metamorphic rocks. The uh, pressures that were imparted on these rocks have not produced a planar arrangement of minerals or what we call foliation. So let's start with quartzite, um, which is, gosh, there's so many things I could say about quartzite. It's probably one of the most common um, rock types out there. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and start at the at the bottom of this fun little list here, um, about 68.3% of all the rocks people bring me are quartzites. Now that I'm saying that obviously in jest, it's, it's a bit of a silly joke, but that's actually somewhat true that a lot of times when people, especially kids are out in the playground or just outside, uh, they tend to pick up a lot of quartzite and there's a reason for it. The reason is that quartzite is incredibly tough. It's hard. It's made out of quartz, it's pervasive, um, it's incredibly strong and, and difficult to break down both chemically and physically. And so it tends to make high points on the landscapes. A lot of ridges, a lot of mountains are capped by quartzite in many locations. Um, I'm a bit scattered here, but the parent rock of quartzite is a sandstone that's dominated by quartz. So if you take a sandstone that's dominated by quartz as its mineral component, and that sandstone were to undergo uh, elevated temperatures and pressures, the sand grains, the quartz grains will actually fuse together and produce a quartzite, which has a little different texture than a sandstone. You can tell it apart from a sandstone by how it breaks. A sandstone will feel gritty to the touch because the rock is breaking and fracturing around the individual sand grains. Whereas with a quartzite, uh, because those quartz grains are so completely fused together that when the rock breaks or fractures, it will tend to break right through those quartz grains. So it will tend to produce a much smoother texture to the touch. Um, I like to call the, the, the visible texture of quartzite somewhat sugary. That's a term I use there. I haven't trademarked it, but um, that's the, the adjective I like to use. It kind of looks like granulated sugar to me in a way. Maybe you'll agree, maybe you'll disagree. And then quartzite comes in a variety of colors. There's just, um, I've seen quartzites almost in, in any color in the rainbow. You know, like a lot of rocks, they'll tend to be um, a lot of more drab colors, but reds and greens, um, all sorts of colors are possible. So let's go ahead and look at a few uh, samples of quartzite here. I've got several. Um, let's just start with Let's start with this one here. Um, and this might help with us on identifying the, the sugary texture a bit. So if we zoom into this rock, maybe even a little bit further, you can see maybe what I'm talking about here with this sugary texture. This quartzite weathers somewhat brown or tan on the outside, but when you break it open, it's, it's white colored. And you can see that the, 
the quartz grains are all somewhat fused together. You can't really discern uh, the outlines of all the individual grains. When you feel it with your finger, it's somewhat smooth. It doesn't feel rough to the touch. Um, so this would be an example of a, a sort of a typical quartzite in terms of coloration, uh, very hard and resistant. One of our properties of quartz, of course, being hard and resistant is that it should, if you can get a corner of it and drag it across a glass plate, uh, sure enough, it'll scratch the glass plate because it's much more hard than the glass. Um, so that's one of the telltale signs of quartzite. Just a couple other ones here. Uh, quartzites tend to often form uh, rounded river cobbles. So if you're collecting a lot of river rocks or rocks at the ocean or beach or any place where rocks are being tumbled together and smashed together, um, you're likely to find quartzites in those locations. Could be a high energy a lake shore, like a shoreline along a lake. Um, so these are typical quartzites as well. This one actually has some uh, pre-existing bedding in it. So when it was a sandstone, some of the bedding has been preserved in it as well. These two have not been broken over, uh, broken open, which is a good way to see that sugary texture. But um, you can be pretty confident with these that these are quartzites. Um, might be confusing a little bit to some degree with chert or quartz the mineral. Quartz the mineral is gonna have more of a, um, kind of a waxy luster to it. Um, you definitely won't see the sugary texture that we saw on the interior there. Um, and so some other quartz rich rocks, you might confuse this with maybe things like uh, quartz the mineral or even perhaps a, a chert, which will break a little differently. Here's another one with, uh, again, the sort of sugary texture. This one's a little more grayish. A little light gray, but again, a very, very hard resistant rock. Um, typically, if you see, I mean, and this is why quartzites tend to just dominate uh, the landscape is they just, they're so hard and resistant, they pulverize all the other rocks when they're being tumbled in a river or by waves or by some other process. Um, and they themselves just get pro progressively more rounded over time as those collisions take place. And then you can imagine these being cemented together to form a conglomerate. Um, but then as the conglomerate weathers, it will eventually weather to the point that it'll release the cobbles of quartzite, which are now back on the ground, able to be transported, possibly cemented again into a quartzite. And so these quartzite cobbles in some places have just been recycled over and over and over from one uh, rock type to another. They just, they just tend to persist uh, for quite a period of time in an area. Uh, a couple other ones here, just showing you a little bit of variety. Here's more of kind of a reddish quartzite. This one's a little bit more coarse grain, so the, the sand grains are a little bit bigger with a little less sorting. You can see some sort of pebbly grains in there. But again, they're, they're fused together and more or less um, smooth to the touch. They do sometimes differentiate quartzites that are basically very well cemented sandstones. So those are sometimes called ortho quartzites versus a quartzite that's had more or less um, complete recrystallization of the crystals, which are sometimes called meta quartzites. But generally, you can't tell that very well in the field, and so you have to rely on more microscopic evidence. But again, the classic sugary texture in this white quartzite here, which weathers uh, brown on the surface. But again, just beautiful um, classic texture there. And then finally, uh, well, actually, I've got two more. Uh, a green, let me zoom out a little bit, a green quartzite. If you haven't seen a green quartzite, again, a really hard exterior. Um, this one's been broken open. You can see all the hammer hits it took to actually break this, this rock open. But once we zoom in, again, you can see the sort of sugary texture that defines the interior where these quartz grains have been fused together. Uh, so quartzite, really common rock. You see it just so many places. Uh, and then the last one I wanna throw in here is a little bit of a, a novelty and something different. Uh, if you if we zoom in on this one, hopefully you can see as I ro rotate that in the light um, that there's some shininess to this. And these are some micas. This is, but then you look at the interior and you see that classic sugary texture um, we can also see some very pronounced layering in this rock. So this is, that's a little better with the, the mica crystals there. This is a micaceous quartzite. So it's a fundamentally a quartzite, 
<clears throat> excuse me, but it has enough mica in it, at least on these uh, old bedding surfaces, that it would be called a micaceous quartzite. And I actually did a video on this specific rock out in the field uh, a few years ago. It is sold locally in southern Idaho and distributed widely under the name Oakley Stone. So there's a town nearby called Oakley where it's quarried out of the earth. And so you might see this sold as like a landscaping stone or a building stone as, a, as an as Oakley stone. But um, fundamentally it is a quartzite, but it has this mica rich uh, material that allows it to part and break into these sheets, which makes it super useful and durable for all sorts of uh, building projects and landscaping projects. The reason we have the quartzite layers and then the mica layers is presumably these quartzite beds represent deposition of sand in some sort of environment. And then the micas or the layers that have the micas would have had a little bit more component of mud, clay minerals, and these minerals and particles have been metamorphosed into mica, muscovite mica, and maybe other types of mica as well. And then it would have more deposition of sand, uh, which would form quartzite. And so it's this sort of cyclical bedding between sand and mud and sand and mud, if I had a whole stack of this, that allows it to split and set into such nice sheets there. So, so there's some quartzites, some Oakley stones. Um, let's just pull the paper over here and move ahead with our, our, next, our next rock we're gonna focus on, and that is marble. I'm sure everyone's heard of marble. It's used in sculptures and uh, has all sorts of industrial uses in, in ancient civilizations. So marble is actually a metamorphosed limestone. So if you take a limestone, which is totally made out of calcite, calcium carbonate, and you induce high temperatures and pressures on that limestone, you will get some sort of marble. Now, limestones can vary somewhat in terms of their purity, meaning how much calcite they have. They might have mostly calcite, but they might have some sand, maybe some mud, maybe some other mineral components that make them a little less pure. And that will, of course, once that rock gets metamorphosed, influence the, the relative purity and also the color and the texture of the marble as well. And that's why you get so many different colors possible with marble is there's Im these impurities uh, and there can be banding in it, um, either due to the original bedding or just these impurities sort of being squished together as it flows. Um, marble has a, a more crystalline texture than quartzite, so if you compare two closely, you'll see that marbles tend to have larger crystals and it's more reflective, and that's because calcite, remember, as a mineral has cleavage planes, and those cleavage planes reflect the light. So as you rotate any given marble uh, in the light, you should see reflections off those cleavage planes. It helps you uh, identify that as being a marble, or at least a rock containing calcite. Um, one of the big distinctive features of marble versus quartzite is marble being made out of calcite is actually softer than glass, so it will not scratch glass uh, as opposed to the quartzite, which is made out of quartz, which does scratch glass. Uh, and then I threw this thing in uh, because it's a bit of a personal irritant when it comes to countertops and some of the um, stone that is used in you know, the commercial stone industry, a lot of things out there being touted and pitched and sold as marble um, it, are not actually marbles. They just have the texture of what someone thinks a marble should look like. And so there's other um, rock types or synthetic materials that are touted as marbles uh, when in fact they're not actually the real deal. So, um, okay, so let's look at a few pieces of marble. I didn't have as many uh, in my collection, well, different types of marble as I thought I did. So I've only got four to share with you here, but you can see the variety of color right away. We've got kind of a peachy pink one, actually a blue marble, which is kind of fun. My students always kind of have fun just wondering how that thing came to be. Uh, kind of a classic pure white marble, and then one here in the foreground that's a little bit more gray. But the um, common denominator in all of these rocks is if you rotate them in the light, you should see some reflective surfaces because it contains, again, those calcite crystals. So all those little reflective surfaces, as I rotate that, um, is telling you that the, the component of this rock contains cleavage planes and also giving you an indication of relatively how big those crystals are. You can see a nice one right about there when I rotate it in the light. So you can see the relative size of that. Maybe 
half a centimeter or something like that. Um, and then, of course, the fun thing to do with the, the marble, one way to distinguish it from the quartzites, and I think you can see how, um, you know, if I hold these side by side, um, these, a marble and a quartzite, let me zoom in on those two, um, you can see how they might be somewhat misconstrued or uh, it'd be tough to determine one versus the other here. And so one test we do in the field as geologists to tell these apart, a quick and easy test would be to grab our little handy dilute bottle of hydrochloric acid to see if the rock really contains uh, calcite. And if we get a strong reaction uh, to the acid or with the rock reacting, bubbling and fizzing, then that lets us know that we have a rock totally made out of calcite. And so this is one field test we often do to let us know what we've got going on there. So, so there it is kind of bubbling and fizzing and making a general mess of things. So um, yeah, so these are four different types of marble. Um, impurities, I'm not sure exactly what elements impart the different colors, like what makes a marble blue, what makes it more pinkish, what makes it gray. Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. I do know that the more white ones tend to be the most pure in terms of just pure calcite content, but what small amounts of other elements would impart the colors in the other ones, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and then one last test I suppose we could do as well would be the, the scratch test. Um, and so if we take the glass plate, make sure we can see well here, and take a sample that we suspect is marble, push, 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 I'm pushing hard, rubbing, uh, notice no scratches, right? Those were the scratches left by the quartzite. So over here, we get a little bit of residue, so it looks like it might have scratched it, but then we realize that, oh, that's actually the, the rock being powdered, and that piece of glass is completely uh, scratch-free in that little section there. So. Hopefully that's uh, somewhat helpful. So again, appreciate all those who have enjoyed uh, this series on, um, fix the camera there, on rock identification. I've got a couple other ideas. There's some other minerals. I might go back to the mineral series and add a few more of those. Um, I'm thinking of some other ideas. So if you have any, let me know as well. I think one idea I had would it be, would, is that it would might be fun to, for me just to get a random rock Maybe I collect it out on a field trip, whatever, and then have you work through um, identifying it with me. So basically we would start with observations, see what we can tell about the rock itself, and then ultimately identify it. Realize, of course, that when we bring rocks into the classroom or into the house and just show someone the rock, it's much more difficult to identify in a hand sample versus out in the field where you have context and scale and relationships with other rocks, which often tell you a lot more about what kind of rock it could be. And so uh, whenever someone just hands me a rock and says, what is it? It's always a difficult process because I don't know where they collected it from, what the context was, what the relationships were, how the rock was oriented. And all those pieces of information are really helpful and something I'd want if I was really going to nail down that, op that observation and that identification of the rock. So uh, at any rate, uh, hopefully that's been helpful. I think we've just wrapped up the rock identification with Will C series. I appreciate everyone who's uh, hung in there with me as well. If you're able to and would like to uh, donate a little bit, there's a donate button at the top of the banner of the YouTube page. There's a thanks button near the right uh, bottom right corner of the viewer that you're watching right now. And under the video description, there's a PayPal link and some other uh, information and options there to donate to the cause if you so choose. But otherwise, thanks for joining me, and we'll see you next time, probably from the field, but maybe from the classroom. You never know. Thanks again.